Hello, hello everyone. I'm Ariel with Urban Essay, a publication dedicated to exploring the world's cities, its history, food, and culture. And we're in Grand Central right now, and I'm, we're about to do a very exciting broadcast because it is with an author that I've been really enamored with the past few months. It has blown my mind, has led to many of the interesting broadcasts I've done, such as the Owls in, in uh, Herald Square, and many of these other tiny stories, such as the Satanic uh, Statue in uh, Madrid. So this is very exciting. But have you ever wondered, what are these symbols of Greek gods and mythology inside Grand Central? They're filled with them. Uh, today we're interviewing and walking around with Mitch Horowitz, who wrote A Cult in America. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, I really enjoy this is a great take on history that a lot of people don't know about. And as you know, on Urbanist, we cover history that most people have no clue about. The guidebooks, the guidebooks don't, call, don't talk about it. The history textbooks don't talk about it. But here we do. So I'm excited to show you this video and share this video right now with your friends and family. We're going to show them the beauty of New York City and all the cool history you can learn and share this video with Facebook groups that you think will be awesome to share with history, New York City, travel, anything. All right, let's go. Hello, Eugene. Hello, Victor. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the broadcast. We are in Grand Central Terminal. Hello, Edder. Hello, Dan. Hello, Brian. Hello, Fabiola. Hello, Arlinda. And hello, everyone. All right, let's do this. Let's go and meet the man of the hour, Mitch Hurwitz. Well, hi. <laughs> uh, okay, so Mitch, tell us a little bit about yourself. What, what do you do? I'm a historian of the occult. I'm a seeker and a chronicler of everything in mystical, occult, and alternative spirituality. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so this term occult, what does it mean? It really is just yeah. a Latin so term yeah, for everyone. hidden yeah. or unseen. It was a term that came into vogue during the Renaissance mm -hmm. when scholars and translators were rediscovering the ancient mystery religions of Egypt, Greece, Rome, and they were trying to figure out how to refer to these things, and they used the Latin term occultus, which just meant secret or hidden. It doesn't mean anything sinister, it means the unknown, the mysterious, the esoteric. Yeah, it can get sinister, but it never, it usually isn't. Well, yeah. you know, in my circle, we like the dark side, yeah. but we like the dark side in terms of the night sky and its translucence, oh, uh, okay. the darkness of the womb. You know, I don't necessarily associate darkness with evil, uh, but I think that the search should take people wherever they want to go, as long as they're not committing any acts of uh, uh, violence or disruption in other people's lives. Of course, and the cool thing about New York City is we're filled with symbols all around. Totally, yeah. And we're going to like this epicenter of these symbols. Absolutely. Yeah. The wonderful thing I like about New York City, the thing I love about giving these occult Grand Central tours, occult New York tours, which I haven't been doing as much in recent years, mm -hmm. is that you find some of the deepest mysteries in some of the most pedestrian neighborhoods. I mean, here oh. we are. You know, standing outside of Grand Central Station, one of the transportation hubs of the northeastern United States. Hundreds of thousands of people crisscross throughout this neighborhood every day, yeah. but they never look up, and they never look sideways, and they never catch glimpses of things that really do tell an esoteric side of our history, and they're hidden in plain sight. It's cool because the city is almost like multi-layered, not only it in really terms is. of actual phys physical layers, but also in terms of history and Absolutely. Yeah. And we view New York as the city of high commerce and high culture, and that's of course true, but there is an esoteric and occult backstory to New York that's real, that you can find in its monuments, in its buildings, in its personalities, Ooh. that makes New York as much the city of, of Mercury, which is actually at the root of commerce, yeah. as, as, of, as of high finance and culture. Okay, this is awesome. All right, we're going to start walking right now. Uh, where are we right now? Okay, right now we are situated center of your screen you can see a teeny tiny bronze statue of right Commodore there. Vanderbilt right on the oh, right bridge there. that connects I Park see. Avenue. Let's, let's go this way. Yeah. Actually, let's hang here for just okay. one moment. Uh, we'll get closer to see the, that 12-foot bronze statue of oh, cool. the Commodore, as he liked to be known. He was never in the military, but he commanded a barge on the Erie Canal. <laughs> yeah. So, not one for humility, he liked to be known as Commodore Vanderbilt. Now, the Commodore 
was way into the occult. Uh, he was asked by a newspaper reporter in 1871 how people could imitate his financial success. Mm. And he told the reporter, do as I do, consult with the spirits. He was completely unembarrassed about being Interesting. a devotee of seances, mediums, table wrapping. And his spirit medium was another New Yorker, a woman named Victoria Woodhull. And Victoria Woodhull mm. was a very notorious, very widely known, very beautiful spirit medium who served as the Commodore's emissary to the other side. She was also a suffragist and a voting rights activist. And many people don't know this, but Victoria Woodhull, the spirit medium, actually became the first woman to run for the presidency. In the year after the Commodore's really? interview, yeah, she ran for the presidency. It was a protest candidacy. What party? In what party? 1872, the Equal Rights Party. Okay. I don't think she ever wound up appearing on a single state ballot, <laughs> but she did it as a protest candidacy. Nice. She had actually gained a lot of national notice because that year she delivered a, an address to a joint session of Congress. She was the first woman, actually, to address a joint session of Congress. She delivered a speech called the Woodhull Memorial, the Woodhull mm. Memorial, and it was a speech on behalf of voting rights. You can find it today on Google. It stands up really, actually, very well as a document of human dignity and protest. And after her speech, reporters said to her, where did you get the ideas for your speech? And she said they were delivered to her in a dream by this ghostly Greek figure wearing a tunic who had been her spirit oh. guide ever since she had been a little girl. And so she is... Did she ever named this uh, figure? She never named him. Okay. This was just her, her, her spirit guide, her familiar and spirit. And this was a close counsel to Vanderbilt. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And, and this, he said this publicly. He said this publicly. The remarkable thing about the spiritualist... Actually, let's uh, let's uh, say who Vanderbilt is, just, oh, uh, just in he context. Was, he was a famous industrialist and railroad magnate, and he was as famous as he was hated. He was considered a very ruthless man. He was considered a monopolist. He was not widely loved by the public, although he was very lovable in his own eyes because he had this 12-foot bronze statue erected of himself, right over there. which we'll get a closer look at. <laughs> we'll actually get you over here. Sure. Okay. The, Commodore, the Commodore was a big occultist and spiritualist, as was Victoria. Yeah. They talked about these things in the newspapers. It's all on public record. The thing I liked about these people is that they were completely unembarrassed about their beliefs. They didn't try to hide anything. Uh, they and this was during the time of, of where spirituality was taking over the U.S. Oh, it was, a, it was a big time of religiosity, although in some regards it was actually a more open time than what we live in today, because today if a big magnate of industry said that, yeah, I'm into the occult and I go to seances and stuff, you know, yeah. he, he would be ridiculed. It would be the source of shock. Now, I think Reagan as, was the last one to do that. That's right. That's yeah. right. And Reagan sort of inherited this quality of just complete absence of embarrassment about <laughs> occult ties. So that was the Commodore. And those were his closest uh, compatriots. Mm. Now, his son, William K. Vanderbilt, who was also a devotee of the occult and mythology and the esoteric personally oversaw the construction of Grand Central. William and K. was his grandson. Did they use all those uh, names, occult, esoteric at the oh, time? Oh, yes, they Terminology? did, yeah. Yeah. In fact, William K. oversaw uh, much of the construction of Grand Central. He was intimately involved in the design and architecture plans, and one of the things that he was responsible for is this extraordinary tripart statue that wow. exists right above Grand Central and, of course, has the Greek god, Roman god Mercury, with his outstretched arm, welcoming travelers, visitors into Grand Central Station. In a sense, Mercury is the god of our city. You know, I was saying earlier that New York is known as the capital of high commerce. Well, the root of the word commerce or merchant or merchandise is Mercury. Mercury was not only the god of oh. communication and intellect and writing, but he was also the god of commerce and human exchange. And you can see if you look to what would be on the right-hand side of your screen, just directly below Mercury and his outstretched arms, in one hand he's holding the caduceus, which is the wand with two serpents of wisdom wrapped around it. To ancient people, serpents were figures of wisdom. You'll find the serpent, of course, in Genesis 3, who became associated with Satan, but to ancient folk, the serpent who enticed Eve into eating fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil Wow. was a messenger of wisdom, of wisdom. So if you read scripture as ancient folk might have read it, the serpent would be 
uh, a bringer of wisdom rather than some kind of maleficent or evil. And it's so used for medical symbols now. Now it's used for medical symbols, although that stems more from from uh, the Greek god Asclepius, who was a god of healing, who also had a wand with a single serpent wrapped around it. Mercury has a wand with double serpents wrapped around it. The wand that you'll see in the medical industry is often Mercury's, and there's a funny story behind that. That became popular in World War I. The Allied Ambulance Corps would use the wand of Mercury as a symbol of safe passage, because Mercury is also supposed to protect travelers. But because it was the Allied Ambulance Corps, the Mercury wand of the double serpent became associated with medicine, and that's what you'll see being worn today on your doctor's lapel very oh, often. Wow. Yeah, it also became associated with hygiene, which is why you'll see it on trucks that belong to the New York City Department of Sanitation. Uh, so, so these symbols, uh, Vanderbilt believe that hold a lot of power. Oh yeah, I mean they took these things very seriously. Cornelius was busy with seances and spirit wraps. William K was busy designing his mansion uh, up in the Hudson <laughs> nice. Valley with all kinds of occult symbols. I've met one of the family descendants, Gloria Vanderbilt. She's very much into uh, mysticism and esoteric spirituality. And it's funny, I've never met her son, Anderson Cooper, but one of the people on this tour told me that they had been on two New York City ghost tours, and Anderson was on both ghost tours. So apparently the Vanderbilt family has kept up its interest in the occult, which oh, that's I very cool. applaud. And Gloria was actually very nice. <laughs> so that is the Vanderbilt family. That is amazing. They were not conformists. Um, so we have this beautiful statue of, of, of Mercury and two other gods capping the entryway to Grand Central. Directly below Mercury, on the right-hand side of your screen, is the goddess Athena, or Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. As we get closer, you'll be able to see that she has her head bowed in contemplation, and she's surrounded by manuscripts and musical instruments, uh, globes, books, uh, scrolls. She has a, a quill in her outstretched hand. One hand is crooked in contemplation onto her temple. Directly across from Minerva, on the left-hand side of your screen, is Hercules, the god of strength, the god of industry, the god of development. He's gazing upwards at Mercury, and he... Uh, were all these a part of the same mythology? Well, they all stem from Hellenic mythology, mm -hmm. which has its earliest roots probably in various strands of Egyptian mythology, but they all stem in this form from Hellenic mythology. And Hercules, uh, and you will get a better look at this as we get closer, is surrounded by instruments of agriculture, of industry. He's holding a mallet in one hand, he's holding a scythe in the other, there's a plow at his feet. So inherent in this statue, you have a certain message, a certain meaning, and that is that if you can unite the contemplative intellectual side of Athena with the muscular and development-oriented side of Hercules, you join them together and you have Mercury, the god of our city, the god of commerce, the god of culture, the god of exchange, the god of art. And the term hermaphrodite, which means male-female, is a marriage of Mercury, Hermes, uh, his Greek name was Hermes, the Roman Latin oh, name is Mercury, with Aphrodite, uh, who is the goddess of wisdom, another name for the goddess of wisdom, or the hermaphrodite, the divine, the divine hermaphrodite, a bisexual, bi-gender figure in the form of Mercury, who celebrates both intellect and contemplation wow, perfect symbol and muscular the, development. Perfect yeah. symbol of the non-binary... Exactly. Uh, yeah. And that's our city. A, as is popular now in today's culture. Yeah, that, yeah, that is the god of our city, the divine hermaphrodite, wow. Hermes or Mercury, uh, rules over our city. And believe me, the people who constructed uh, the sanctuary and who designed it, who paid for it, who organized it, they weren't just putting together decorations, you know, and, and that's a very important thing to say because sometimes you'll look at something symbolic and say, yeah. well, gee, that's an alluring image, but is it anything more than just decorative? And that's an important question to ask. Which is also a stereotype with America. Like yeah. We, we uh, take a lot of things from other places right. while fully knowing what they are. Right, we just like the outer husk. And in some cases, that's true. But in this case, there's a lot going on in this statue. You know, you always have to ask yourself, where's the story, where's the history, what's the symbolism? And the characters involved in erecting this statue and the archetypal figures that are represented by it really do tell a full story. So this is more than just decoration. Uh, there's mythology being encoded, encrypted into this beautiful statue. And the people who erected it 
particularly the Vanderbilt family, they knew what they were doing. The artist, by the way, who designed this was a, a French artist named Felix uh, Alexis Couton. Felix Alexis Couton. He was part of the Beaux Arts movement, which was also wrapped up in the occult revival that was sweeping through Europe and America in the late 19th, early 20th century. So he was very much in the know about everything that we're talking about. Interesting. So mo a lot of Beaux Arts architecture has a lot of occult imagery. Oh, for sure. In fact, mm. if you look at this building next Ooh, to us, which Ooh. is the Bowery Savings and Bank. Actually, building. let me uh, reintroduce yeah. you. I'm Ariel with Urbanist, and this is Mitch Harwood, who writer and author of Occult America. Uh, right now, we're in Grand Central Terminal. Like this page if you want to see more videos like this, and share this video right now with your friends and family. If they're lovers of history, or if they're lovers of the, the occult, share it with or them both. right now. Yeah, right on. <laughs> So this building, just directly adjacent, diagonally across the street from Grand Central, is the Bowery Savings Bank building, which went up about 1923. Uh, there was a building boom in the wake of Grand Central. Wow. If you look at the archway, and it's very difficult to see this, but we'll try to zoom in on it. Yeah. Just below the floral decoration that's about midway up from street level on the archway, you'll see an image of Mercury. It's a figure wearing a Greek traveler's helmet with wings sprouting from the side of his head. Wings in place of ears. Are you able to see that? Uh, you, right there. Like, uh, can you get a beat on it? Just start at street level and go up. I'm going to even point to it on the screen. That we can see. There he is. There he is. Okay. Yeah. The cool thing is, Beaux Arts architecture. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Beaux Arts architecture would use something called the mirroring effect. The mirroring effect. If you put something on one side of a room or on one side of an archway, you were supposed to mirror it on the other side, which creates a kind of harmonious balance. It's kind of a classical form of feng shui, we could say. So this figure of Mercury that's kind of hidden away, the god of our city, right on this uh, uh, beautiful arch, is actually mirrored on the other side, and that's true oh, all around this building. Alright, everyone share this video right now. Press that heart button. Mercury, the god of our city, is mirrored right on the other side, just oh. below that floral sconce over there. If you're able to see it, he's a little difficult to see, but once you get a beat on it... That is truly it, hidden. Right yeah, there. you'll never forget it. So, if you come to the Grand Central area, you will pick up on the wow. fact that Mercury is mirrored all around this Bowery Savings Bank building, which is one of the most significant buildings in Midtown Manhattan. It was part of the building boom of Midtown. So the Beaux-Arts movement was very wrapped up in mm. mythological images in the esoteric. Now we'll head toward Grand Central directly to get a better image of that 12-foot bronze statue of the Commodore, humbly placed. Let me say hi to everyone. Hello, Karen. Hello, Phil. Hello, Helena. Hi, Slovakia. Uh, Helena is a good name. To, uh, to, yeah, <laughs> uh, like uh, Helena Bolotsky. Exactly. Uh, hello, Tamara. Is this a, is this a trip or what? Yes, it is. Uh, and Tamara says she is definitely not a conformist because she's from Native. She's a Native upstate New Yorker. Oh, and that's interesting. She's from the Burned Over District. Uh, that's that's my. That's my brethren right there. And Arlena says she loves discovering New York mysteries. And uh, hello, Brenda from Maine. And thank you everyone so much for watching. And Mitch says hi to Mitch. There's another Mitch watching. Oh, tell him right on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so cool. we're situated across yeah. the street from Grand Central, and we're going to be super careful crossing the street so <laughs> we don't wind up on the cover of the Daily News tomorrow for the wrong <laughs> reasons. But as we cross the street, the thing that I want to invite you to do and invite yeah. all your viewers to do is look up, look up at the stretch statue Always of Mercury. Always look up. Yeah. yeah, because the real way to view this statue is to pass underneath it. When you do, you'll see with your own eyes that it takes on this indelible quality of a living thing, of a living thing. Now, Mercury, in addition to being the god of our city, is the god of the arts, of commerce, of intellect. When you pass under this statue that way, you can make an appeal to Mercury. You can say, hail Mercury, and you can ask for something that you wish for, that you're striving for in your life. Maybe if you're an artist, there's a project you're trying to complete. Maybe if you're a financier, there's a deal that you're trying to complete. Ask Mercury Urbanus, for his good favor. Urbanus is becoming the next ja National Geographic of the 21st century. That's right. Yes, Mercury. And this is the only <laughs> tour where you actually get to make an appeal to an ancient god. Yes. What, if we, what if we've erred? What if we've erred? no longer worshiping the ancient deities and they're lonely and they're hungry for our attention. What if you Could and be. your viewers <laughs> were to make an appeal to Mercury right now, this morning, and because you've given him this attention that he hungers for... Press that heart button to give Mercury some attention. He'll shine with special favor on you. <laughs> something will happen. And you can email us and let us know the good thing that happens to you. Oh, and also let us happen. know what would you wish to Mercury in the comments. Yeah, I like it. 
Okay, so when the time is right, we're gonna cross the street safely. Mercury is the god of travelers, so we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll pass right under Mercury, look up at him. You'll see he, he has this quality of a living being. Say, hail Mercury, and make an appeal for whatever you Here we go, here we go. And yes, tomorrow, this is the Vanderbilt, indeed. Hail Mercury. Hail Mercury. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And to think that this was very close to being the most. Yeah, we'll say a word about that when we get inside, as a matter of fact. Actually, uh, And a tribute to the people who saved it. After you. Thank you. Now, so, all throughout this building, there's images to, to Mercury. You see, there's the Caduceus, the one with the two serpents. Oh, right above the door. Yeah. Okay, so everyone, keep your eyes peeled because we're going to see a lot of we're gonna walk imagery through, around. And we're going to enter uh, what's called Vanderbilt Hall, and then we'll say a word about the preservation. Um, so, in lieu of the preservation of uh, Grand Central, uh, Penn Station, do you think also had a lot of occult imagery, with the original one? The original one didn't quite have as much as this because the Vanderbilt family was not involved with it. There wasn't a commensurate patronage. It had some more, it had a, a certain Hellenic revivalist splendor, but there wasn't a lot of occult imagery. Mm, okay. uh, but its loss is a tremendous loss, and the same thing almost happened to Grand Central. What happened is the, uh, this beautiful station had fallen somewhat into ruin, it wasn't being kept up, and there was a developer in 1974 who was planning to purchase the land, uh, bulldoze Grand Central, and put a skyscraper up in its place. And yep. a coalition of New Yorkers led by Jackie Onassis Kennedy managed to intercede and save the building. Jackie Onassis Kennedy hand wrote a personal letter to Mayor Abe Beam, who was the mayor at the time, and she wrote to him, it's a very elegant letter, it's preserved in historical documents. She said, Americans care about their past, but for short-term gain, they are all too willing to tear it down and destroy everything that really matters. She was a great conservationist and a person of real intellect in her own right, and under her leadership, a group of New York City conservationists got together and managed to save Grand Central. And if it weren't for... And did uh, she have ties with a, a cult beliefs? So? No, no, not Because she also preserved the Temple Dendor and... Oh, that's interesting. In the Mets. That's yeah. interesting. No, she was just a great conservationist, but she did have a principle about conservation, which is somewhat being violated today in Grand Central, and we'll get a look at it right in this room that we're standing in. This room is called, uh, it used to be called the, the, the Vanderbilt Waiting Area. Vanderbilt Waiting Area. Mm -hmm. Massive yeah. waiting area compared to Penn Station. Yeah. Modern day Penn Station. Absolutely yeah. massive. This room, I think, is one of the most beautiful rooms in America. It's Ooh, one of the most beautiful interior spaces in America. However, Jackie Onassis had a conservationist principle, and it was this, that if you start to use grand public spaces for purposes other than what they were originally intended for, people begin to forget about them. They begin to lose their splendor, and it raises the possibility that they will get destroyed, which is exactly what's happened here in this Vanderbilt room. Now, this room was originally meant to be a vast open space with just a few benches for people to wait on. But several years ago, uh, the MTA and the corporation that controls Grand Central opened it up to commerce, to public events, and to shops. And what happens is, as you'll see here, there are coffee stands and other things, which are pretty common. Do you think a Vanderbilt would have Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. And the reason is this, and here there's a Japanese and uh, let's uh, let's raise the audio level because it's it's pretty loud. In yeah, here. yeah. yeah. Um, behind us is a, a, a Japanese tourist board exhibit. When this room is empty, and there are rare occasions when it's empty, you will actually see tourists and visitors come in here, and their breath is taken yeah. away, and they look up, and they're taking pictures, and they're just stunned by the epic nature of this room. It's this massive cavern. It's like a cathedral. But when you load the room with neon signs and coffee stands and public spaces and so on, no one's looking up. Take a look. Look at all the folks passing through here. No oh, one's looking point. up. No one's taking pictures. People are looking at the because coffee. Because I, I came here about two years ago, a little bit less than two years ago, and it was empty. And I had that same impression. Yeah. Like, oh, wow, it's, it's huge. It's an indelible experience of walking into this cathedral-like space 
But when you fill it up, nobody's looking up, nobody's looking at the magnificent mm. ceilings, the windows, the fixtures. They're looking at what muffin they want to choose. And, you know, commerce and beauty can coexist. They coexist all over our city. But when you start to use these spaces for purposes other than they were intended for, they lose their splendor and they become invisible to us and they are in greater danger of being demolished. So we have to be very careful because some of that is creeping into Grand Central again. And like a, like a, for example, it's like remaking an uh, English castle into a mall. Right, exactly. No one's going to be looking up at the tapestries of the arched ceilings. Everyone's going to be looking at the swatches, you know, and that's it. So that's sort of happening here. Now, we're going to go into the Grand Concourse, which has a Zodiac mural, which is probably the largest Zodiac mural in the Western Ooh. world, and it is a, a, a site of real splendor, and you'll see there's a room where people are looking up. So Ooh, let's wow. proceed right, into let's the do Grand that. Concourse. All right, let us know where you're watching from, and let us know what other hidden secrets you have found in your nearby city. Melba says, thank you so much for this treat. Oh, yeah, Melba, thank you so much for tuning in. And we'd love to visit Grand Central Terminal just to see Mercury again. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone, you're about to see one of the largest murals of the Zodiac in the entire world. Uh, so be prepared to be wowed. Steal yourself. <laughs> okay. We're going to situate ourselves right here. Now, if you if you can angle the camera All right, up, everyone, get ready. This is the magnificent right Zodiac mural wow. that, that occupies the ceiling, the dome ceiling of the Grand Concourse of Grand Central Terminal. People come from all over the world to look at this, to shoot this. Let me get you over here. It is one of the largest Zodiac oh, murals. Oh, Mitch, let me get you over oh, here. Oh, sure. It's one of the largest Zodiac murals in the world, ancient or modern. This is truly one of the greatest mythically oriented murals that humanity has ever produced. And if you take a look, yeah. I'll sort of direct you up here, you'll see that it is a particular slice of the zodiac wheel. And that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna tell you about the meaning behind that, the secret meaning behind that. You have a uh, right constellation there. of Aquarius over here, the water bearer. Then you have Pisces. Then you have Aries, then you have Taurus, who's being faced by Orion the Hunter, which is a constellation that's not part of the Zodiac Wheel, but that's adjunct to Taurus. Um, you have Cancer, uh, I'm sorry, you have Gemini, the twins. And then finally, all the way over there uh, to the east of us, you have uh, Cancer, the crab. Cancer, which happens to have a little block inside right, of it that right. represents all the tar from smoking. That's right. Yeah. When this building was restored in the 1970s, the ceiling was almost completely blackened by tar mm. from cigarette smokers. And the, Which is such a shame to have this completely hidden. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, well, it wasn't totally hidden, but it was largely obfuscated. Mm. And the restorers left one brick untouched so people could make a comparison and see how uh, the ceiling had at one time looked. Mm. And you'll always come in here and you'll see balloons that are left over yeah. by revelers. People wander through here drunk on New Year's Eve and they <laughs> let go of their balloons and they stay up there pretty much the whole year. Um, but there is a, 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 a sort of a secret of encrypted within this beautiful, beautiful subsection of the Zodiac Wheel mm -hmm. that a lot of people miss. And outside we were talking about the question of decoration versus meaning. Now when people look up at this, they're taken away by the beauty of it, by the epic scale of it. And those are all very impressive and moving things. And this is the largest one in the world of the Zodiac? It's certainly among them. It's among certainly them. Okay. among them. But there is a deeper story that goes beyond the decorative, oh, which is epic in itself. There's a deeper story that you can find encrypted. And it exists in the crisscross of those two lines that we see directly above us, if you're able to get a oh, shot of that's that. interesting. What There's a crisscross of two lines. That represents the vernal equinox, the vernal equinox. Mm. The point when the sun on the horizon line rises between those two lines signifies the arrival of spring, which we're right on the, the brink of. This year, the vernal equinox is March 20th. That's this coming Tuesday. So we're here at a propitious moment. Now, what you see going on here is this. 
The thinner line that doesn't have any separations in it is the uh, celestial equator. If you were to imagine Earth's equator projected out into the cosmos, mm. that would be the celestial equator. That's one of the two lines of that make up the vernal equinox. Mm. Um, that is, again, the equator line projected out imaginarily into space. The thicker separated line, the thicker separated line is the ecliptic or the zodiac wheel. The zodiac oh, wheel. Interesting. That's the line that the sun seems to chart throughout the sky if it were in fact the sun rather than the earth that were in movement. That's the imaginary line that the sun charts throughout the sky. And it is the ecliptic or the zodiac wheel. Sorry, when the, when the, technical issues. Take your time. <laughs> when the sun rises in this crisscross, this crisscross that we see in the ceiling that demarcates where the ecliptic and the celestial equator cross, that is the dawn of spring, the vernal equinox, mm. which again is happening this coming Tuesday. Now, here is an interesting fact which is depicted in this subsection of the zodiac wheel. The evening sky that we 21st century people see when we walk outside and look up is actually not the same as the evening sky that our ancient ancestors saw because the Earth How has ancient? Oh, going back to, say, ancient Babylonia, ancient okay. Egypt, you know, okay. millennia before Christ. The, the, Earth's, the Earth has a wobble in its axis, a wobble in its axis, so that because the Earth wobbles a little bit, as it revolves, our vantage point for viewing the night sky changes ever so slightly every 72 years or so. Mm. So over the course of thousands of years, what we actually see when we step outside and look up at night is different from what our ancient Egyptian and Sumerian and Babylonian ancestors or Greek and Roman ancestors would have seen. It used to be, it used to be that the vernal equinox rose in the sign of Aries, the ram, which is a symbol for spring. So that's when you would say they were in the age of Aries? Yes, yes. exactly. Then, because of this wobble in the Earth's axis, a phenomenon occurs where this crisscross of the, uh, of the ecliptic and the celestial equator seems to precess, mm. seems to move backwards through the zodiac. So, in the time of Christ, the vernal equinox, this crisscross, occurred in the adjacent sign of Pisces, the fish. Pisces. Christ was said to be the fisher of men. That was the Piscean era. That was the Piscean era. And as this degree of, of recess occurs, at least to our naked eye, through the zodiac wheel, we are moving toward, we are moving toward we are the close. Aquarian era ah. or the age of Aquarius. People in the early 21st, people in the early 20th century believed that humanity was entering the Aquarian age. This was popularized in the song Age of Aquarius from the musical Hair. Oh, I see, okay. A lot of people in the late 19th, early 20th century, when Grand Central was being erected, thought in these very idealistic terms that humanity was moving into the age of Aquarius when the sun would rise in spring, this Tuesday, in the sign of Aquarius. So is it you, happening this Tuesday, the age of Aquarius? Is it well, not the, the vernal equinox is happening 20, this Tuesday. 2021 around there? But people don't agree, oh, they don't do uh, agree precisely yeah. on when the so-called age of Aquarius begins. It's a question of how you interpret the sun entering the sign of Aquarius. I mean, we're talking about a, 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 a vast optical space here. And another but, interesting thing is uh, we're also entering an age where we're facing the center of the galaxy. Yes, that's right. That's uh, right. Which which uh, a lot of people are afraid of right. in people many circles. Are, people are afraid of it. I mean, there's <laughs> it also a means of, a lot more meteors and comets and right. There's, other there is some disagreement like precisely as to the, the pinpoint in time at which some of these celestial events occur I because see. there's a lot of interpretation as to when you're in the sphere of you know Aquarius for example what did you the see ancients here, who make these imageries did they have theories or as to what the mathematics were oh you? absolutely absolutely in fact here in modern times what you're really looking at here is a portion of the zodiac wheel that's from a medieval design when we were in between the ages of Pisces and Aquarius and 
the precession of the equinoxes, as it's called, was moving in the direction of Aquarius. That's what's being demonstrated in this image. You're seeing the movement of the vernal equinox, the precession of the equinoxes, in the direction of Aquarius, because the people who designed this mural, about which I'll say more in a moment, believed, as did many who were part of the occult revival of the early 20th century, that humanity was entering the age of Aquarius, which would be this new era of universal understanding and spiritual awareness and education. And of course, a lot of those dreams got crushed in the 20th this century. This is kind of happening. It's, it's one hope. With uh, videos like these. <laughs> I, I, right, with videos like these. I, I feel like we're polarized. You know, yeah. We're polarized between um, this kind of violent tribalism and between an era of authentic awareness mm. and there's this tremendous tension going on maybe something like that is always going on but the always way that, happens when there's like a growth period yeah it's inevitable it's Within, as individual but also in society yeah so how that plays out will probably result in how people look back on our own era because i think we're balanced on this precipice as this chart in, a, in effect demonstrates humanity being being poised between the Piscean era of mm. Christianity and the Aquarian era of what might be called the New Age. Now, there's a strange wrinkle with this zodiac mural, which a lot of tour guides yeah. talk about, but very few actually understand. Okay. It is a fact that. The wait, 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 let's tease this out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, looking at up at it right now, what do you guys notice? Do you guys notice anything odd about how this is placed? <laughs> <laughs> let us know in the comments. You know. Yeah. All right, so so what is it? What well, what is it? What what's the cosmos wrong here? are reversed. They're oh. depicted backwards. What? The chart, <laughs> the zodiac chart, is actually not what you would see if you looked at the night sky. It uh. is mirror image reversed. West is east, east is west. It is backwards, and a lot of tour guides and historians remark upon this with humor, as if, well, look, you know, here is one of the most magisterial murals in the modern world, and. They messed it up. <laughs> they got it backwards. Those dummies, you know, and people take great pleasure at pointing out what seems to be this huge gaffe, this huge uh, mistake marring this magisterial mural. Now, there are two lines of thought about this. First of all, this mural was designed by a French portraitist named Paul Hellier. Paul Hellier. He was also part of the... Sure. He was also part of the Beaux-Arts movement. He was a contemporary and friend of the painter John Singer Sargent, among others. And Paul Hellier came to America for a very fixed period of time, specifically to design this uh, mural in the early 1910s. And as most historians and tour guides would tell it, he just messed up. He goofed. This magnificent, enormous mistake was made, and he reversed the image of the zodiac wheel. Now, there are two lines of explanation about this. The more practical line is that which I've been articulating, that it was just this massive mistake. And that may very well be true. Although I because have Because when they were painting, they were looking down. They were looking down. Sure. Now, I have come into Grand Central myself with my own zodiac chart laid it out on the floor, as I imagine Paul Helliou and his collaborators would have been doing when they were painting their ceiling mural. And frankly, it's not that confusing. I find it somewhat difficult to imagine that a group of artists would have just gotten turned around and yeah. painted the mural backwards. But it is possible. And it's kind it of easy. Possible. It's kind of easy to convey that now. Kind of like think about that now because we barely see the night sky. Yes, we barely well, see the night sky. Today. In the 1800s, they would definitely known where right. the stars were. There was less ambient light. People were a little bit better able to navigate. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but anyway, that's the practical explanation, mm -hmm. and it may very well be correct. I see. There is a more romantic explanation. <laughs> which I personally favor, and I'll put it out there, and your viewers can make the determination oh, cool. for themselves. The more romantic explanation is this, that Paul Hellyu was purposely devising this mural so that rather than being an individual situated on the earthly ground looking up at the night sky, you, the viewer, would be like a god viewing it from above. So you would be like Mercury and 
uh, uh, Athena and, and Hercules outside viewing this scene from above. So that well, when you almost look like at this mural, like a snow globe. Yeah, you're like a celestial being. Exactly, that's well put. You're like a celestial being viewing events from a heavenly vantage point rather than from an earthly vantage point. So you can take your pick. Did Paul Heliou just make this <laughs> tremendous mistake? Or was he, in fact, attempting this beautiful cosmic statement in which the individual would be like a god viewing the cosmos from on high like a snow globe? One really doesn't know, and I have searched and searched, and oddly enough, no one seemed to ever just directly put the question to him. He had mm. returned to France, and no one hunted him down, no journalist or artist, and said, by the way, what was your intention here? <laughs> so it's, Did people even know about the Zodiac at that time? Oh, people did. Yeah, they it, was, did? it okay. was widely known. Mm. Uh, but, but history has recorded this as just a big gaffe and a big mistake and people chuckle over it and they may be right and what do you think Vanderbilt uh, thought of that or uh, I, I think, you think he was intentional in doing I, this I think Vanderbilt I suspect he was intentional I think Vanderbilt like me would have opted for the more romantic explanation yeah. I'm not sure anyone asked I'm not sure anyone fully and firmly knew uh, there was some response at the time where it was said that this was the intention to look at it as a god from above Either explanation could be true, it's not definitively known, but that is the most commonly identified fun fact about the ceiling of Grand Central. But like most fun facts, there's a, a deeper mystery there that isn't fully captured by just saying, well, somebody made a mistake. Because there's, as we've demonstrated, a lot going on in the imagery of this building. I'll point out quickly. Oh, actually, uh, Ian has a question. Are the stars officially lit on the ceiling? Some are and some, some aren't. Are. They're, they're, they, they are selectively uh, lit, just to show the anchor points of some of the constellations. Uh -huh. Some are and some aren't. Oh, there's also, you might be interested to see, above here, Aries, there's two constellations that are not uh, part of the zodiac, a bee, a bee, which represents the work of bee productivity, and this this double uh, triangle, mm. a near isosceles triangle, and, and a standard pyramidic triangle. Um, what that's representing, that's called triangle. What that's representing is something called the golden mean, where the smaller, uh, you'll see that, that the smaller portion relates to the larger portion, um, and and. That's a, a, a measurement, basically, that repeats throughout nature and that was used throughout much Egyptian and Hellenic architecture. It's, it's the golden ratio, the golden mm. ratio. Um, the, uh, the smaller... The people, I think, is like the mathematical equation of beauty. That's right, that's right. It's considered the mathematical e e e equation of beauty mm. um, in which the, um, the smaller portion... Uh, uh, relates as like a, um, the, the larger portion is a perfect square of the smaller portion mm. and it's a proportion that's repeatedly found throughout nature and it, it creates a feeling of harmonious structure so that's what's being represented by triangle mm, fascinating um, there's also other images of so, mercury throughout the building you can see along the windows there is a wheel with wings which is a symbol mm. of mercury there's the caduceus you can also see another symbol of, of Beaux-Arts architectural principles at work here, which is the mirror effect. The mirror. You have three oh. grand arch windows on one side of the building. They are perfectly mirrored on the other side of the building. Every time you see something happening in a Beaux-Arts structure, always turn around and you'll see the same thing happening behind you. So if there's an archway or if there's a triangle or if there's an entry, turn around you'll see the same thing mirrored behind you it creates a sense of balance a lot like the golden mean it's interesting and another principle of this room and this was something that that's was why held, this room feels uh, comfortable it feels comfortable doesn't it yeah mm. that's a perfectly chosen word because the beaux-arts architects also had another principle which was that the rarest resource in an urban area is horizontal space people are absolutely mm -hmm. desperate for horizontal space because in cities like New York we're all scrunched up together and buildings are squeezed up together and that when you give people an expanse of horizontal space as with this room it creates a great feeling of restfulness like you use the word comfortable yeah very very well chosen word that's exactly 
what they were going for. A feeling of comfort, a feeling of restfulness, like, oh, I can finally relax, I don't feel squeezed in. That's exactly what's missing in the Vanderbilt waiting room. That was originally intended to be uh, a room that demonstrated this feeling of great, restful, open space. And that's been lost in there because it's been filled up with vendors and exhibits and so on. But that's still very much a part of this room. Now, I have a question. Uh, in the Morgan Library, there's also a huge mural, the Zodiac. Yes. Uh, do you think this occult philosophy was with a lot of the top industrialists, also like J.P. Morgan and... Right. Well, to some extent, it was the design of the day because oh, all the Beaux-Arts yeah. architects were into it. You know, the, the Vanderbilts had a special passion for the esoteric. More so than the other I think more so. I think more so because Cornelius was very specific about his interest in spiritualism and advising people to consult the spirits like he did and so on. But... <clears throat> and do you think they use this positive thinking philosophy in, in their business practices? I think so. You know, you, you'll find in interviews a lot of the industrialists would talk about the idea of picturing what they wanted to see. Cornelius specifically, in, in another story, he told a newspaper reporter that one night he had a vision of lights extending all the way up Park Avenue in New York City, and he began to buy up land related to that. Oh, cool. And at the time, Midtown Manhattan was, was an ash heap. I mean, there was no Midtown Manhattan in the late 1900s, not the way we know it today. I'm sorry, yeah, it was a huge uh, canyon for train yards. Yeah, it was a canyon for train yards. It was industrial. There were ash heaps. There were reservoirs. There were still some farms. It, it was Nowheresville. And Vanderbilt said that he had this vision of lights, illuminated electric lights, going up Park Avenue. And he began to buy up land and lay rail track there. And then that's when the development of Midtown Manhattan began. So he believed very strongly as did um, and to, to, uh, Andrew Carnegie, that the mind had these picturizing powers, and they took oh, yeah. visions very, very seriously. Visions and they weren't, weren't eccentric people, things. really. They were just, they okay. talked about this, but they weren't actual eccentric. Well, they, they, they were, we might consider them eccentric in terms of the validity that they gave to mysticism, but to me, it humanizes them. Yeah. Because they were ruthless people, they were very tough people in a lot of ways, but there was also a very human side to them where you could sit down and have a conversation with them about these kinds of things and probably find them very easy to talk to in that way. Yeah. Fascinating. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. This was a vast, beautiful temple to the mythological and to the occult. What I want to do is take us through yeah. the corridor uh, behind us, which is known as the Ray Bar Corridor, point out a couple of things very quickly. Okay. And then we'll exit across the street and we'll look at one more item before we say goodbye. That's amazing. All right, let me uh, do this broadcast one more time. Hello, everyone. I'm Ariel with Urbanist. This is a page dedicated to explain the world cities, its history, food, and culture. And today we're in New York City's Grand Central with author Mitch Hurlwitz. He wrote Occult America and One Simple Idea. A few other books, right? Yeah. I have a new book coming out in October called The Miracle Club, which is actually about some of these figures and the mind methods that they use. That's exciting. Share this video right now with your friends and family if you want to show them the beauty and history of New York City. And like this page if you want to see more videos like this. We explore cities all around the world. And we're going to explore many more awesome secrets like these today uh, in future broadcasts. Thank you so much for watching. We're going to continue walking through Grand Central. Now, um, this is called the Grey Bar Corridor. It's geared for by a different company. It's not as well kept up as Grand Central. It's geared for by the Grey Bar Power Company, whose building is adjacent to this, and we're going to look at something. Um, oh, this is one of my favorite Grand Central, though, because this is one of the only areas where you can actually lay hands on the statuary. Oh, I, uh, this is a is this one brooding the looking little angel. Yeah, I love him. I love him. He's like a fallen angel. And uh, he's mirrored oh, over here by another fallen angel looking a little bit more like a gargoyle. But you see the mirror effect. You know, what are they up to? These guys are definitely up to mischief. Let's you know, just take a look. I love them. It's the only statuary in all of Grand Central that's actually at eye level, so you can go right up to it. That's here in the Grey Bar Court. This is not cared for as much as the rest of Grand Central is, but it's got some neat statuary uh, lining the perimeter, and it's worth seeing. There's a lot of images here. That's an image of a serpent swallowing its tail. It's an image of infinity. There's a lot of other images here of wings of angels, winged horses. They all speak to transportation. Are we nearby the secret 
tunnel stop for Franklin Delano or Roosevelt? No, it's, it's, it's on the opposite side of the building. And that's an interesting part of history, although I don't usually get into it on this tour because I'm just dealing more with the imagery, but that's on the opposite side. But just uh, to give everyone context, uh, FDR was another one, another president who oh, dabbled yeah. in the occult. Very much. His, his vice president, Henry Wallace, who was in office, who was his vice president before Harry Truman, who is now known history. We're going to cross the street over here. Yeah. Wallace was very deep into the occult. He was not a real, you know, I mean, he was a theosophist, he was into astrology. He spoke very ingenuously about these things. And Wallace and, and FDR got together and placed the, the beautiful, alluring image of the eye in the pyramid on the back of our dollar ah. bill, which was the reverse of the Great Seal of America, but had not been much used publicly. And they both loved it. Okay, so we can stop here for a moment. And we Phil are. says, Phyllis says, thank you so much, history and magic. I uh, love it. And George uh, asks, he says that apparently there was a painting, a mural above the original mural inside. Do you think that would be something Nothing that I'm might have happened? Um, the, the, the original, that, that mural went up at the building's opening. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that mural went up in 1913 at the building's opening. Um, and then the statue of Mercury was installed just a few months after the opening in January of 1914. Oh, cool. Yeah. Right, so now we're, we're across the street right now from Grand Central. We're looking at the Gray Bar building, which was put up in the early 1920s mm. by the Gray Bar Power Company. And there's a beautiful statuary on this building, but I just want to show some couple of neat little features real quick. You'll see that there is a awning or a canopy that's extended over Grand Central by these mm. three iron bars. And if you look at the three iron bars, about two thirds of the way up, you'll see these three oh. iron rats oh. on the bars. Everybody gets very excited about the iron rats. What are they doing there? Why are there iron rats on the canopy of Grand <laughs> Central? So cool. And you'll see immediately above the rats are these three cones. Um, this is actually designed in the style of a freight ship and the uh, three iron cords are supposed to be docking cords that mm. moor a ship to a dock and sailors would often put cones on the docking uh, cords to keep dock mm. rats from climbing up into the ships. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing three rats climbing up the, the mooring ropes that dock a, a ship to its port and the cones wow. are there to keep the rats from climbing onto the ship. So that's the Be, story being a native of the New Yorker, iron rats. <laughs> being a native of New York, I never noticed that right. in if, my life. <laughs> if you have friends coming from out of town and you only have time to show them one thing real quickly, you can say, come look at our iron rats. That's what they're doing there, and that's what they represent. The Grey Bar building is, is kind of magnificent in its own right, and it's an example of the type of architecture, also using mythical and occult themes that grew up around Grand Central in the wake of Grand Central, accommodating and validating the Commodore's vision of lights going all the way up Park Avenue. I mean, his, 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 the construction of, of Grand Central on his land really did precipitate a vast building boom here in Manhattan. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, now, if you look, we're going to look at four pieces of, of base relief or statuary that are carved into the side of the Gray Bar building. They represent, among other things, the four elements. You have on the left-hand side of your screen Atlas, the figure of Atlas, who's holding the globe. And you have opposite Atlas, he is facing the god Neptune, the god of the seas, who's holding a fish with water coming out of its mouth and who's wearing a crown to signify his being the god of the seas. And we're going to take a jog uh, north to take a look at the other four pieces of statuary. This building. It's decorated with these Egypto-Hellenic looking figures. You can see them over That's here. Wow. They're, they're holding modern telegraph devices. They're harnessing um, the power of, of electricity, the power of the broadcast waves. One figure is holding a, a truck, very plainly oh, modern. I love that. Yeah, celebrating transportation, modern transportation. I mean, you have this... And celebrating a uh, broadcast. Yes, Egypto-Hellenic <laughs> figure holding a truck. Another, he's got a telephone in his hand. They both are holding in their hands. And fun fact, see, the original CBS was here in Grand Central Terminal. Oh, is that right? Yeah. But it was such a noisy place that they had to move only after a few years. I believe it. 
And oh. so these, these figures are, are, are designed in this, oh. this kind of Eastern Hellenic fashion. And uh, we're when gonna, you say Eastern Hellenic, what do you mean? Well, you can see, and we'll get a better image of that mm. uh, as, as we look at the final figures, but they have like an Egypto-Babylonian look to them. You know, if you take oh, a look at them, see. they look almost Alexandrian. You know, they're Hellenic and they're Egyptian. Look at the, look at the headdress. Look at the design. They're not quite Western. There's a mm. there's a, a Euro Egyptian look to them, and we'll see that in even better uh, relief on these final figures that we're going to view. <laughs> these and are my favorites. Phyllis says this really opens her eyes to this beautiful city. Oh, bravo, oh, Phyllis! Thank you. Okay, so these are the final four figures on the Gray Bar Building. Now you'll see on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see a very very unusual and original image mm. again of our friend. Mercury. How do we know this is Mercury? Because he's wearing the traveler's helmet with the wings on it, and he's holding what seemed to be. He has two, a beard. He has a beard. He's holding what seemed to be two carrier pigeons. Again, Mercury is the god of travel, the god of transport, the god of commerce. Now, look at this figure, especially. He looks. He has a Eurasian look. That's yeah. not a Western face. That's not a Western oh. face. He has this Eurasian. Egypto Persian kind of look. The extended eye line. Look at the extended eye line and look at look at the look at the beard, you know. I mean it in the rolls, so like very curly yeah. hair. Almost like if it were like Russian or That's right. Uh, There's this element of um, the Hellenic, the Persian, the Babylonian, the Egyptian. Mm. It's it's very, very unusual to see a figure like this. It's the most original depiction of Mercury that I've ever seen. It's this truly uh, syncretic figure. It's not just a strictly Western Hellenic figure. And the same is true of the figure that he is facing, who is Prometheus. Prometheus, Prometheus. holding fire in his hands. Fire bearer, right? And Prometheus was the fire bearer, yes. And in Hellenic mythology, he was said to have stolen fire from the gods and come and enlightened humanity. You see, he has wings. He is also considered in some regards a sort of fallen angel. And some figures associated him with the figure of Lucifer or Satan, one who fell from the heavens, but who brought enlightenment to humanity instead of forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He's holding, he's holding a torch, he's holding a flame, which allowed people to illuminate the night, to warn themselves, to cook. And it's also, of course, a flame of wisdom. And we're also seeing the four classical ancient elements. Uh, we have down there at the other end, Earth being held by Atlas. Right there. We have the seas, water being held by Neptune, uh, air being commanded by Mercury, and both that you carry pigeons and fire pigeons uh, by Prometheus. Oh. And so you can see how these images, although they're more Art Deco in a sense than some of the ones that we were looking at inside Grand Central, which are more classical revivalist, mm -hmm. they have that same occult and esoteric imbued throughout them. They're not just postage stamps. They're not just decorations. These are real images of meaning that were held dearly and taken wow. with a, a, a solemnity by the artists and the developers and the architects who designed these buildings. In a certain sense, the Commodore's interest in the occult left its imprint all throughout Midtown Manhattan. And that is occult Grand Central. Wow. Uh, if we look up, we see <laughs> Always a whole look other up. story. Yeah. Always look up. There's a, there's a hidden narrative uh, fascinating. built within our city. And this is a piece of it. This is a piece of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. For, a pleasure, man. Uh, if people want to learn more about the occult, they should read Occult in America, but where else should they look into? Oh, they could just put my name into Google. It'll take you to my website, MitchHorowitz.com. There's all kinds of videos, articles, books, things you can download, all kinds of goodies and links. And, and you, can, you can start your journey there. Um, I'm writing a column called Real Magic at Medium.com. If you go to Medium and put my name in, there's articles about everything from cult history to American vampires to <laughs> rethinking Satanism to uh, the esoteric side of positive thinking. Anything you can ask for is and if, there. And if you enjoyed this broadcast, press that heart button right now and share this video with uh, friends and family who love history. And um, uh, what second book should they get after they read Occult America? Well, uh, two books of yours. that I'm very fond of, Occult America and my book One Simple Idea is a history of the positive oh, cool. mind movement. I have a new book coming out which can be pre-ordered. It's called The Miracle Club. 
and it's about some of the mystical ideas that were popular in the early 20th century and which among them really seem to work. That's called the Miracle Club and that's coming out in October and it can be pre-ordered right now. Yeah. And you also do talks. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, I'm all over the place. If you follow me on but social media. But here in New York City, right? Oh yeah. Usual talk uh, I, I'm yeah. doing all kinds of stuff. Let's see. I have um, I, my, my most immediate talks that are coming up are out of town. I'm going to be cool. in Virginia Beach. I'm going to be in Houston. Uh, I'm bopping around all over the place. I'm going to be in L.A. soon. But I have other things that I'll be coming back around to here in New York City. If you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, I'm posting these things all the time. But for people who live in Virginia Beach, in Los Angeles, in Houston, I'm coming to your neighborhood very soon. Cool. If you enjoyed this broadcast, you'll, follow, you'll definitely enjoy his talks. Thank you, everyone, so much Thanks for watching. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. See ya. And I usually give away goodbye when I'm doing a broadcast. Won't care to join me? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do uh, it. First hand right there. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye now. <laughs> All right. <laughs>